Welcome to Peoples and Things, a podcast about human life with technology. I'm your host, Lee Vinsel, an associate professor of science, technology, and society at Virginia Tech. You can reach me with comments and suggestions at leevinsel at gmail.com or on Twitter at STS underscore news. I would love to hear from you. In 2021, a book came out about, first, a pandemic, second, a bunch of violent yahoos attacking significant social institutions, and third, a people perceiving themselves to be in a spiritual crisis. No, the book was not about the United States of America in the final days of the Trump administration. Fingers crossed. It's about Provence in the 1300s. The book, published by Cornell University Press, is titled Souls Under Siege, Stories of War, Plague, and Confession in 14th Century Provence. It's by Nicole Archambault, an associate professor of history at Colorado State University. Souls Under Siege tracks how people reacted to a series of crises of plague, warfare, and spiritual uncertainty, how they made their way through trials and tribulations, including via problem-solving and creative responses. It's the kind of story that maybe you'll feel like you aren't automatically interested in. After all, when's the last time you thought about 14th century Provence? But believe me, you want to know about this. It's fascinating. Most of all, I think Souls Under Siege is a tribute to what historians can accomplish when they enter into deep, sympathetic, interpretive relationships with the people they're studying. As you'll see, Nicole came to her sources primarily hoping they teach her about plague, but she found these people were concerned about different problems altogether. And by listening to the stories these people were telling and not foisting her own interests on the text, Archambault opens their world to us. It's a neat book, and we had a fun and interesting conversation. You'll see. Get excited. Nicole, thanks so much uh, for taking the time to talk to me today. It's nice to be here. Thank you for the invitation, Lee. Uh, I love reading this book. This book uh, made me very happy, partly probably because it has very little to do with what I have to do most days in my work. So that it was even more of a pleasure for being kind of just like teaching me all kinds of cool things. So when you tell strangers about it, if that's even something we do during these um, kind of co weird COVID times, what what would you tell them you were doing with the book? What were you up to? Well, I tell them that I was writing a book about a time period when people were living through a pandemic and there was civil unrest and warfare and people were really concerned about uh, the present, you know, dangers that they were facing, but also kind of existential dangers. Um, and... People were going in maybe a, a, a more spiritual, religious direction with some of those dangers. So I pretty much am talking about the, you know, 2020, 2021, right, 2021. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah, it's, it's, it, that's, I, it's not what I set out to do, but the book came out right in the middle of this. So. It, yeah. It, I it remember like we were in, we were, we were in COVID times and then January 6th happened, and then your book came out, and it's like, wow, you know, who would have thought this book would be, like, right on the money time lane with, uh... <laughs> I yeah. really didn't want it to be. That was yes, not, well, thank that's you. That's not a good thing. <laughs> right. Yeah, a lot of people's work became timely in the, in the, in the way we wouldn't hope for, maybe. Um... So I think probably a lot of people who will listen to this have not thought about 14th century Provence before. 
Uh, and so can you say just a bit about like what society was like to just kind of like set the scene for folks who have, who have not thought about this history before? Um, it, it does seem, uh, it can seem very um, esoteric to be writing about Provence. When people think about Provence, they tend to think about lavender and rosé and sunshine yeah. um, and the sea and all of this stuff. But Provence at this time in the 14th century was actually the seat of the papacy. So hmm. the entire papal court was located in Provence, which was this the biggest bureaucracy in Europe uh, in the 14th century. And it's also one of the main ports for the Mediterranean into Europe. So this is, was a, kind of an important port, an important bureaucracy, all kinds of things are happening in this area. Uh, it also, one of the things that's useful to remember is it wasn't part of the Kingdom of France. Uh, it was part of the Kingdom of Naples at this time, which was sort of a discontiguous kingdom um, that had an outpost in what's now Greece, um, what's now Spain. It was all kind of all over the place, and part of that was in uh, Provence. And so we see it as very much a place that was connected with Europe, but also the Mediterranean, North Africa, the East. Um, it was a very central region. Um, so if mm -hmm. we're thinking about Provence at this time, it's a crossroads. It's, it's an important crossroads. Um, hmm. We're also seeing this at a moment where uh, this particular region is being drawn into the Hundred Years War. Lots of people have heard of the Hundred Years War. Um, and this is between France and England, and they're fighting with each other. Um, most of that fighting doesn't, almost none of that fighting happens in Provence. But what happens is during the Hundred Years' War, the main troops that everybody is hiring um, are mercenary troops. Um, we don't really have national armies at this point. Yeah. This is, uh, we have a lot more of these small groups of soldiers who work together, sometimes around 50 to 100. Uh, these band together under successful uh, war leaders. Mm -hmm. And then kingdoms, other groups, um, hire these war leaders to work for them. Um, so it's very much a monetary system in terms of warfare. I mean, there are local regional militias and this kind of thing, but if you want to win, you hire soldiers hmm. to do this. Mm -hmm. So Provence ends up uh, bearing the brunt of these soldiers during truces in the Hundred Years' War when they're not employed by uh, other groups. And so during truces, thousands to tens of thousands of mercenaries end up unemployed and get jobs elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, there's a lot going on there. And the uh, um, mercenaries, I mean, one thing that se seems true of this period is that you might have mercenaries from, I don't know, the Netherlands, what, what's going to become the Netherlands or, or Switzerland or, but like the idea that you're going to just fight for your own nation, you know, there's no such, I mean, nations don't exist yet. So they're just, they move around, right? And they fight yes. for who has the money. Yes. Mm -hmm. And if they're not being paid, they tend to live off the land wherever they are. They don't, mm -hmm. it's not like they go home. This isn't, yeah, there's a lot of roving bands of soldiers at this time. Right. And the plague, of course. And the plague. And um, how, I mean, is this still, I mean, it's the medieval period. So, uh, you know, Middle Ages, however we want to talk about it. But it's, um, uh, you know, is it is it that kind of classic image where most people are peasants and, but there's also cities where there's trade. I mean, what does the kind of social world look like? I would say it's a, uh, uh, there are cities, particularly in Southern Europe, in this region in Provence, uh, Southern France, the Iberian Peninsula, Italian Peninsula, there's a lot more cities, but there are increasing mm -hmm. numbers of cities in the North as well. Um, and they're very interconnected by travel and trade. These are not isolated little places where, you know, people might never travel in their lives. There's definitely a culture of travel and a culture of trade in a lot of these places. So there are, there are a lot of peasants. People do, you know, work on farms and grow their own food and, and all of this. And then there are market towns where this is redistributed out. Um, mm -hmm. So I wouldn't think of it. We do tend to think of it 
uh, popular shows tend to present the Middle Ages as very dirty and kind of dark and gritty. Yeah. Um, and I don't think that's really a very accurate picture. Uh, there's uh -huh. a fair amount of basic literacy that people needed in order to get by um, hmm. in almost any profession unless they're laborers or, or that kind of thing. And even then, if you're in a city, there's a, like a very small amount of literacy that would be quite helpful to have. Um, so I think we're seeing, we're not seeing the American frontier. We're not seeing this kind of yeah. rugged individualism of little towns, very much interconnected. People produce goods and they trade them and they travel to do that. Mm -hmm. And how do you, how do you end up coming to write this book? how do you go down that path? Well, I set out to write a book about plague and I'm very interested. I, I have a, a degree in, uh, uh, anthropological linguistics, and I'm very interested in how people communicate and how they do things with words. Um, and so I was looking at different kinds of sources that I could use to get at how people talk. And uh, very early on, I found uh, inquest sources, uh, the legal inquests where uh, people come in and give testimony. And, you know, I've, I've looked at all different kinds, criminal inquests, civil inquests. And then I, uh, uh, my advisor at the time told me about uh, this canonization inquest. Hmm. Um, and this is a legal uh, process to see if someone should be an official saint of the Catholic Church. She's like, take a look at this. People are giving big, you know, are long testimonies. There's lots of interesting people involved. You should take a look at this source. And I looked at it and I looked at the time period of it. It was uh, uh, put together in 1363. So the first wave of plague is 1348, second wave is 1361. Like, oh, there's going to be lots of plague and people are going to be talking about it and it'll be awesome. This is going to be yeah. the best source ever. And then I go through it and find almost no one mentions the plague. Hmm. In There's a couple of healing miracles and that's about it. Um, and the only way they mention it really is as a time marker for other events. So it's obvious that everybody lived through it. It's obvious that everybody remembered it, but they're not really talking about that. So I sort of had to reassess mm -hmm. uh, what I was doing and realize that they're talking more about war and confession as mm -hmm. these dangers that they're living through at the time than, than they were talking about plague. So I had to kind of reassess what I was doing based on the, based on the source and what they wanted to talk about. Mm-hmm. I want to talk to you about those three dangers uh, a bit more um, in a second. But was the um, was the source was it kind of known? Had other people written about this inquest, or like you know, or or was it fairly underutilized to the, up to this point? Well, I sure thought it was underutilized. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I. Uh, I uh, it, it was well, it was known. I mean, this is not uh -huh. a new source. I didn't go into an archive and, you know, brush the dust off yeah. this, you know, amazing new tome. Um, I'm working primarily with an edited uh, version of it. So it has okay. gone through the first uh, process of going from something that's handwritten in Latin to uh, something that's typed out. Mm -hmm. um, I also have the, the handwritten Latin version, but the edited uh, version is quite good. Um, one of the things that is interesting about these canonization inquests is that they tend to be kept alive within the Catholic Church. Um, there's a group called the Bolandists, and they're interested in uh, promoting saints. Um, this is after Council of Trent, after a lot of the, the Reformation attacks on, oh, you crazy Catholics who believe in saints. Um, mm -hmm. The, there's a whole branch of the Catholic, uh, or a whole group of the Catholic Church that gets very scientific about saints. And so they gather all of the written documents that they can find and the evidence that they can find. So we see all of these uh, canonizations being kept. Um, and so it's actually edited by a Franciscan friar hmm. uh, in, the, in the 1970s. I mean, this isn't something happening deeply oh, in the past. Oh, interesting. Um, so he's trying to make sure that if the Franciscans want to push this uh, particular woman um, 
for canonization again, the documents aren't lost. You know, this mm. isn't going to disappear. And it's easy for people to access the documents that way. So yeah. it's not it's not hidden and other people have used it. But they've because she wasn't canonized, right. they tend not to study her when they study official saints. Mm -hmm. So I was just much more interested in the document itself and the people around the saint rather than the saint. and, and the, Right. Yeah. So. so in grad school, I had to read this famous book that you'll know, which is Monty Yu, which uses like the records from uh, yeah. an inquisition, the inquisition done by the Catholic Church. But instead <laughs> of being interested in the questions of the inquisitors, um, the author found that the text also contained a bunch of information about kind of daily life and yeah. really draws it draws it out. And so I saw, I mean, you're more interested in religion than I, I see lottery. I mean, you're, you're talking a lot about religion, but mm -hmm. are you up to something similar here? Is it, is it part of what interests you, like all the other things the documents show us about the world? Yeah, that uh, Montayu, the promised land of error, um, Emmanuel Lokala, he, he really uh, set people on another path for using these inquests. Um, and he's actually using much more difficult documents. Um, we tend to call it the Inquisition. Yeah. But it's really just inquisitors all over the place, and they're sort of connected. Um, but the kind of document that he was using would be very similar to the kind of document I was using. They're both inquests. They're both legal procedures, asking people lots of questions, asking mm -hmm. a lot of the exact same questions. But I found that... Uh, in looking at those documents, people are trying to hide things from the questioner a lot of times. Yeah. Um, whereas in this document, the same things aren't at stake. Um, nobody's going to lose their lives. Nobody's going to lose their right. house. Nobody's going to lose anything. They're not trying to figure out if somebody was uh, a heretic. Um, yeah. They're really just trying to find out if this woman was a saint. So you'd get a lot of the same information. And it's, it does talk a lot about daily life. And this was a moment at which daily life was very difficult. So mm -hmm. it's it's an interesting document. Um, this might be connected to your um, you know, your work in linguistic anthropology, but I think it's just connected to your kind of interest in the world and you know, going back to when you're very young. But your the idea of story seems to be really important to you. Yeah. And in fact, like your um, dedication page is thanking your mom and dad for you know introducing you to the power of stories. I think so. Mm -hmm. You know you're examining these stories that people are telling and what does this kind of like idea of story or approaching it as story get you that maybe other ways of approaching these things you might just miss or not make us sensitive to or something like that. I, thanks. That, that's a great question. The stories as, as I approach them, we tend to think of stories as something that, uh, as something that's kind of cute, something that we tell to children um, something that we make up and make believe. But um, there's been a lot of research in uh, anthropological linguistics about how stories, even the simplest stories, uh, kind of structure the morals of a community. They both uh, reinforce them, but also reveal mm -hmm. them to others. So you kind of construct what's right and wrong as you put together a story. So... I mean, even a very simple story, uh, even a very simple, like, you know, you're talking to your friend and they ask you how your day was and you say, oh, this person was really mean to me or this person was really mm -hmm. nice to me. That little story, you and your, and your co-teller are creating the norms of the world. You're, you're saying, this is a nice thing to do to someone. This is a horrible thing to do to someone. So when I'm talking about story, and stories and how people tell them, they're really structuring a lot of their moral worldview, mm -hmm. even when they're just seeming to be telling something that's, that's a lot simpler than that. So if they're you know, telling this wondrous tale about how this holy person saved their town by creating an imaginary army that was defending it, um, that is building kind of what, what's appropriate in this place. What is, what is important 
to these people and what is morally acceptable and what's morally unacceptable um, to these people. So I found that looking at the way they structured their stories, I could see what they were worried about mm -hmm. and what they were concerned about. And it wasn't what I expected uh -huh. them to be concerned about. So it took a lot of extra time to kind of rein myself in and stop reading for what I wanted. Yeah. And start reading for what they wanted to say. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And I think it's it's actually a nice way to kind of seg to the three kind of crises that you talk about, which are, you know, plague, war, and problems around confession. So, um, you know, like, part of you, you, you've already kind of told this story, you go to these documents looking for plague stories, basically, and that's not what they're giving you. So how do you how do you think about that? I mean, like, why are they not talking? It is like kind of you, you as you explain in the book, it's kind of like a second wave of plague, which is not as deadly as come through, which probably we know less about, I think, in kind of the story of the, the Black Death and stuff. So what do you make of it? Is it just so kind of in the background that they don't have to talk about it? Or, uh, yeah, I mean, what, what? how do you understand that silence? That's such a complex question. Um... And this is, it's, scholars are really starting to think about it now even more intensively. Um, I, what I understand from this text, and it took a long time to get there, is that for these people, plague has become part of their world. Yeah. After the first wave of plague, people weren't sure if it was going to come back again. And so we get uh, some sources that talk a lot about plague. And they're very, ex a lot of them are extreme sources, mm. um, really hand-wringing. Did we bring this on ourselves? Is this a punishment from God? Um, a lot of these extreme responses. And then after the second wave, it becomes an illness. It becomes mm -hmm. something that, okay, so it's come once, it's come again. We're starting to see it and understand that it, affects people in a certain way. Um, and that, and that, uh, that information is coming from medical texts at the time. So for people who had experienced it multiple times, doctors are starting to try to treat it. They're starting to talk about it in a certain way. Um, I think the witnesses in this inquest, and I slow, and this is what I'm talking about when I, I mean, or what I mean when, I, uh, when I'm talking about that they use it as a time marker. Mm -hmm. uh, and if we think about that, I know it sounds, it doesn't, it doesn't have much impact when I describe it that way, but this is something that every single person could say that it, at the time of the first mortality, this other event happened to me. Yeah. So they know that every person they're talking to will know exactly what that means. Mm -hmm. It reminds me a little bit of um, when people would talk about 9-11. Mm -hmm. uh, I think so, we might already be heading that way with COVID, yeah. right? I mean, we yeah. talk about before times and stuff like that. It seems like it'll become a, a marker in time, like 9-11, these yeah. kinds of things. That sounds right. Yeah, so in about 10, 15 years, we'll see how people are, you know, how, how people are, are talking about it. But that's kind of how they, they wove it into their lives. It wasn't mm -hmm. something that they... Ex that they dwelled on mm -hmm. in the same way. But that's not, so to get to the, this next crisis, that's not true of the mercenaries, apparently, because they're talking about that a lot, right? Yeah. Yes, this is something that they're facing, and they're facing waves of it. Um, and I feel like this is a, this is a problem with a face. Mm -hmm. This is a problem with a face and a body, and this is a, a, a problem that is part of this community in a very different way. Um, the mercenaries, while they might be from all over the place, were also from, this, from roughly the same social class as a lot of the people who testified. Um, the people who testified could become mercenaries if this is something mm -hmm. they wanted. They were, um, a, a lot of the people who testified were in the social class of uh, the military or um, kind of this political group. Um, 
that would be expected to fight. Mm -hmm. And so this, this group makes more sense to them. And they're seeing this group of mercenaries as a danger to their community. But this is something they have a little bit more control over. Um, this is a political crisis that they can try to either avert or they can try to minimize. They can mm -hmm. try to change these mercenaries uh, into something else. So they t I think they talk more about this because uh, in some ways it's a little bit easier to deal with and understand. Mm -hmm. And finally, I mean, um, what's up with confession? I mean, how can confession be a crisis, right? This, this I think, seems very, I don't know, I think this might be hard for a lot of people to access. So what's going on? I mean, first of all, maybe we should just say, like, confession's not so old at this point, right? Um, it's not, the, the, like, more formalized institutions fairly recent at this point, is that right? It had gone through some changes in the last, in the hundred years before this. Um, okay. So it went through sort of a transformation of uh, people f sort of going through confession themselves, sort of going through the process of their sins and, and feeling forgiven internally. Yeah. And then uh, there's a process where that is externalized and becomes something that a priest is involved in. Mm -hmm. um, and... You need the priest to say, I absolve you. You have to say uh, the sins out loud uh, in order to, to be absolved. Um, you have to remember all of the sins and confess everything from yeah. the age of My reason. My list is long, onward. so it would be hard. I agree. Exactly, exactly. I think that's why some of the people in the book you know, who are feeling a lot of anxiety about confession remember all of their sins as if written in a book. Um, so I think people, and we're looking at a, a group of pious people. This is a group that's surrounding yeah. a holy person that are, is testifying um, in front of papal commissioners to the deeds of this holy person in this canonization inquest. So this is a pious group. They're not super pious. Uh, they're, they're probably maybe a little bit more pious than average. Yeah. Um, the, the majority religion at this time was Catholic Christianity. So this is something that everybody participated in and Confession was something that was supposed to happen at least once a year. Mm -hmm. um, so this is something that everyone participates in. They've internalized the need to do this. Mm -hmm. um, and inherently, however, confession is both disciplinary and consoling. So it's meant to discipline people to kind of train them to not do certain things yeah. and to ha feel guilt if they do certain things. Um, but it's also supposed to console them. And it's supposed to say that if you feel badly about doing those things and you confess them in this, through this process, then you're all right. You're good with God. God forgives you. Mm. We're done. You, you're great. Um, and that's meant to make people feel better. Mm-hmm. And what I'm finding in these testimonies is that the consoling part isn't working. Huh. Um, that they aren't feeling better. They're just feeling anxious hmm. um, and kind of living with this, with this fear. There's also practical problems that are happening when people get sick and they're trying to uh, give their last confession. Um, often they can't speak. They have too high of a fever. And so even if they can speak, they're talking like a lunatic. And mm -hmm. so there's not really a way to, to, to do that, to, yeah. to fix that problem. So there's problems that, there's, that they're running into that's making this thing that's supposed to console them, especially in times of when you know, death is close, either from plague or from warfare, and they're supposed to feel better, and it's actually making them feel worse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that's kind of the crisis of confession. And it's really important to people. They talk about that all the way through this yeah. source. It kind of parts of it about this, this feeling it reminded me of a, so a, a very important person in, in my individual development was my uh, gay Buddhist Chicago living uh, English teacher, Mr. Wilson, who had come down to Joliet every day to teach mm -hmm. us English. You know, he got me into philosophy and into all kinds of stuff. But he used to tell, he told this story about how, I think his, both of his grandfathers were ministers, I think, and one of them was a Baptist minister. And so he got, you know, at, at the time came to get the dunk and he got dunked, uh, you know, he, 
he was baptized, but then he came up out of the water and he didn't feel any different. And he was like, oh, this is like, this is a problem, right? There's a problem mm -hmm. that eventually led him out of the church. But you can kind of think like it it's supposed to console me and make me feel something. But if I don't have that feeling, what it was going on? Is it me? Is it the spirit? What's going on? And we, and people talk about these doubts of conscience that they have, yeah. kind of these nagging doubts. And they go to confession and they don't feel different. And they go to confession and they don't feel different. And they start feeling worse and worse. And some people end up in this, you know, heading all the way to despair. Yeah. Um, so it's it's really problematic for them. I mean, yeah. in a in a multi-religious society like we live in, there's lots of different options. There's yes. not the same kind of <laughs> pressure to, yeah. to do this. But yeah. this is not a multi-religious society. Right. You can't just hop over to yoga or whatever. That's not yeah. an option yet. Yeah. Uh, and the other, you know, something, I, it comes out in your book, but it's also something we've talked about before, is that, like, there are right and wrong ways to do this stuff. So, like, I think, like, in modern terms, especially for, you know, more secular folks, it's like, well, that's just magic. And magic doesn't really have rules and, like, proper ways to do things. But that's not true here, right? I mean, these rituals can go wrong. Uh, and if you don't do them right, that's, like, that's important. I, I don't know if you tracked it at all, but there was a, a big scandal in uh -huh. the United States recently where there was a priest who had been saying all of the baptismal uh, uh, rites wrong. And yeah, I was going to bring that up to you. It's a oh, yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, all of, yeah, these people are not <laughs> baptized now. This, is, right. this didn't work. Uh, they have to go. I don't know if they're going to go back into it again. I don't know what. Is, I think that's happening. it. Yeah. yeah, because it's like, you know, part of me is like, why can't the Pope just like wave a magic wand from the Vatican or something? But it's like, the answer is that's not how this works. This is a BFD, big fucking deal. Like you have to, you have to do it over again, right? Yes. I mean, so yeah. Yeah. Well, this, there's this sense that the, the clergy at this time are, are like the link. Mm -hmm. So there's, you know, the average believers and there's the clergy that's the 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 link. They're they're your 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 patron, who's who's your link to God, um, and this is a person who is supposed to who has a little bit who has more of a of a relationship to God than maybe the average person and can speak on your behalf. Mm -hmm. um, if we think of kind of a Roman patronage system, this is this is there's evidence of it um, uh, happening here as well. So if either the priest doesn't do it right or the penitent person doesn't say it right or do this right, then, you know, there's another apparatus that kicks into place, which is purgatory. And this is also a miserable, you know, it's, you know, at this point, people are seeing it as a very miserable place to be, yeah. um, not somewhere you want to end up, or damnation. And so if you don't say things out loud to a priest, if you don't hear the words, I absolve you, um, if you don't, feel the right kind of sorrow. If you're only afraid of hell yeah, and you don't actually feel bad for what you did, confession didn't work. If you don't plan to stop doing what's sinful, mm. confession doesn't work. Then Man. you're just, you're just making a mess. Um, Martin Luther said like, if you're going to sin, sin boldly, that's, they don't buy, they're not of this school, I guess. No, I mean, that's one of the big things that Martin Luther, I mean, this is one of the things that drove Martin Luther to break away. Yeah. Confession is kind of the heart of it, that, that mm -hmm. you actually can't do this process. He yeah. actually doesn't think people can do this process. This, is, this uh -huh. was the big push for him. Um, so you can see why people might be stressed out about it yeah. when they might die at any time. Sounds miserable in a, in a way, you know, I mean, it reminds me of the Puritans and, and I mean this and not in a kind of yeah. superficial stereotypical way, but they're, right. you know, Perry, My Perry Miller, I think, has the book called New, New England Mind. It's like these people have spent a lot of time being Calvinists worried about whether they're going to hell, basically. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and so like, yeah, it sounds it sounds hard. It's very hard. And this is a group of people that wants to do it right. And they're yeah. trying to figure out what is right. Uh, there's one person in the book who is really concerned because she's been given an amount of penance that she doesn't think she can do before she dies. Uh -huh. And she's really upset about this. She's, you know, worried. 
and the holy woman at the center of the of the inquest kind of consoles her her fears on this and says, "No, no, no. Let me explain how this works." Mm. Um, and and she feels better about it. But it's 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 a lot of concern. There's a lot mm-hmm. of concern about this and a desire to feel better, to mm-hmm. not feel sorrow and contrition and anxiety all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, another thing that comes out in the book, especially in the, um, the uh, oh, you call it conclusion or maybe epilogue, um, sorry, a, a conclusion, it, it comes out there, but it's also written through the other chapters, is uh, they have a different conception of like the relationship between the mind or no, I would say body and soul. I mean, we have our own conceptions mm-hmm. of mind and body and stuff, but you know, there, these things are deeply interwoven. So can you say a bit about that, about just how they, they conceive of selves differently than we might? Sure. Yeah. That's just an easy question to talk about the entire body and soul concept. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let me just, you know, riff on that for a bit. Um, <laughs> um, I, they have. A, I, I'm going to start with medicine. I'm going to start with mm-hmm. kind of a medical view because that's one of the easier ways to do this. Um, their medical system, the way they understand uh, the body, is based on a Hippocratic Galenic uh, medical system that kind of pervades a lot of uh, of daily life and a lot of the texts that survive. And a lot of what's at the base of this is kind of a concept of balance. Mm-hmm. That there are all these different things in your body. Humors and stuff, right? Yeah, I mean, we might, the kind of the, that would be sort of the medical jargon yeah. would be humors. Um, but these things that are in your body that should be in balance, if you have too mm-hmm. much blood or if you have too much phlegm, if you have too much uh, uh, melancholy, kind of this uh, kind of dark mist substance that ends up in your body, um, when these things get out of balance, then that's when you get sick. Um, and for them, they didn't really see the emotions, what we call emotions. They didn't have mm-hmm. a term for that. Uh, they didn't mm-hmm. use the same term. Um, they called them either the passions, something that you suffer, mm-hmm. um, or um, something called this, uh, the, oh, what do we say? They're part of the six non-naturals. Uh, these things that are outside the body that affect the body, um, things like air and breathing, um, emotions would be part of that. Mm-hmm. Um, they're called accidents of the soul, but that's really complicated and I don't want to get into that. <laughs> um, <laughs> We don't have we don't have that much time, um, and so they see these as things that are going to affect your health and affect the balance of of what's going on in your body. So these are right up there with sleep, food, mm-hmm. the air quality. These things are crucial. They don't really separate the mind the way we yeah. tend to, uh, a lot of our medical terminology and the way we kind of think about it is focusing on the body, but they're going to look at both. And mm-hmm. there's a medical side to this, but there's also a spiritual side to this and they're not separating those out. Mm-hmm. So when they're talking about, we use this word emotions and it just doesn't translate hmm. um, because they would be talking about the, the pasio, the suffering that the body goes through when you're having any kind of uh, what we would call an emotion. And mm-hmm. that has a big impact on your body. I mean, yeah. for some of the medical doctors at the time and, and people at the time, this in and of itself could cause disease and death. Mm-hmm. So it's just a very different way of understanding what we call emotions, what those mm-hmm. are, how they work, how they affect your body. Um, and it's they're as crucial as everything else you yeah. know, as crucial as food and right. we tend not to think of of emotions that way but for them yeah. they're thinking of it the same way i don't want to romanticize the way they think or like say i want to go back to those times because i don't, don't believe that at all but i do think i mean like some ways they're thinking about this might be healthier than the i mean you know like uh, koreans have this notion of like anger depression it's like when you end up in a spiteful a job that you hate Mm -hmm. and the koreans believe that you know like anger depression is terrible for you 
and will yeah. eventually kill you, you know? And we know, yeah. I think we know that's true of anger and, and these kinds of things are terrible, very bad for your health. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, there's a, there's some ways in which I think our, our kind of dualistic thinking about this kind of stuff sometimes uh, leads us in bad directions. So, And it's interesting to see in a lot of the, I see there were popular medical texts in the 14th century called regimens of health. And so these were, here's the appropriate kind of exercise you should get and the appropriate kind of, you know, if the air you're breathing is, is, you know, poor, you, here's ways to go and, and improve it. And emotions are right in there. Yeah. Um, and there's lots of different ways. They suggest lots of different wonderful ways. I mean, it all sounds like going to a spa to me. <laughs> right. But go it's... take a walk. That actually, yeah. you know, like that is yeah. good for you, actually. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Go be in a beautiful place with lovely uh -huh. people and flowers and nice music. Hey, man. And light sunlight. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, sure. I would love to do that. That would be <laughs> <Yeah>. great. <laughs> right. Right. Um, so your book is organized around, um, you know, six or seven individuals, depending on how we count and whether mm -hmm. we, we count the inclusion in that count. You spent a lot of time with these people, like years, I'm sure. So did any of them become your favorites or you're like a good parent who won't cop to favoritism? Where are you at with that? Oh, gosh. Yeah, of course. I, I started to really like some of them a lot. Um the, one of the most interesting people to me was the woman who's the focus of the first chapter, which is Bertrand de Bartolomea. Uh, she is probably, we don't know for sure, but she's probably like lesser nobility of mm -hmm. Provence, local aristocracy. Um, and she ends up being a servant, uh, a serving woman for Delphine, kind of a, like a constant companion for mm -hmm. about over 40 years. And she doesn't hold back. She just tells you all of these different stories, all of these different events. And she's really kind of this in-between person. So she's the kind of person that doesn't get invited to the big fancy party, but she hears all about it from mm -hmm, everybody, mm -hmm. from everybody who went and, oh, and yeah. all of this stuff happened. So she has all of these little tidbit stories yeah. that um, you aren't going to get anywhere else. No one else mm -hmm. is going to tell this. Uh, the other, one of the other people I like, and he's not a focus of... A chapter at all. He's getting a paragraph. I'm trying to find another way to write about him. Is this important legal figure in Provence? He's got this job. He's called. He, he was something called the Judge Mage um, for uh, for Provence. Which, if you're in D and D, sounds really exciting. But yeah, uh, cool. <laughs> he's really. It just means he's the the royal uh, judge. Uh, for the he's the judge of, of kind of the royal court in in Provence and he has many of these different titles where he's like the most important legal figure in Provence at various times and he's testifying in this inquest and he loves telling these fun little stories he he's so excited about the 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 soldiers the 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 imaginary soldiers that appear that the, that the mercenaries who are attacking a town, they see these soldiers on horseback riding through the night and think, oh, we can't attack this town because you know it's protected and we didn't know they had this, uh, these soldiers. Um, he's fascinated by all of these stories. He loves hmm. telling them. So it's interesting to me, we will never see this side, we never see this side of people from the, from, of legal figures. Mm -hmm. from the 14th century we only have the legal documents that they mm -hmm. signed or that they mm -hmm. produced and so to hear him get really excited <laughs> yeah just be a about person, miracles right? yeah. yeah oh i think that's great that that makes me really happy that that's quite a treat uh-huh i was thinking um just to give kind of listeners a sense of you know how you kind of work with these different individuals um you have a chapter on lady andrea raymond well, how mm -hmm. would you say this? And and the great companies. So, I mean, like, what, how does what she talks about in her world kind of allow you to, to see something about the mercenaries that maybe you don't see from other sources? I would say that, uh, although a lot of the witnesses... Uh, talk about these and we read a lot about mercenaries they were a major problem in europe and so lots right. of different people are writing to each other uh about uh these mercenary soldiers uh, 
And a lot of the bureaucratic language ends up being very hand wavy. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the bureaucratic language is, oh, these horrible figures, they're or these horrible men, they're behaving horribly. We need to, you know, get rid of them all. The something needs to happen. They they even call crusades against these mercenaries mm -hmm. um, and try to give people more reason to fight against them. Um, and in those letters, uh, women tend to be presented almost exclusively as victims. Mm -hmm. So women are, are victims of attack, um, of you know, capture and ransom, mm -hmm. of rape. Um, it's, it's uh, you know, women are just, you know. Yeah, it's rhetorically figures. powerful, yeah. right? Because it means yeah. they're taking advantage of the weak or something like that. It means they're taking advantage of the weak, and they really are. I mean, yeah. there's really no way to stop them. Mm -hmm. um, so we have evidence of, of towns being captured, held, ransomed, and six months later they're captured again. So right. there's really no way to stop these guys. And so it is a problem. I'm not saying that mm -hmm. that picture isn't right. Mm -hmm. But in somebody like uh, uh, Lady Andrea Ramon, um, she, in her testimony, she's presenting her way of dealing with a problem. So she didn't mm -hmm. just see the mercenaries and say, oh, you know, there's nothing I can do. Um, she turns to the holy woman that, you know, this holy woman, Delphine, that is at the center of the inquest and prays for help and Delphine helps. And Delphine helps in a couple different ways. Uh, Delphine holds the mercenaries back who are trying to attack Lady Andrea um, in this ambush that she is involved in. So the holy person holds back the, the mercenaries, but also inspires Andrea, Lady Andrea, with courage. Mm -hmm. And she becomes empowered in this moment and writes about feeling massive courage, so much so that it inspires the other people that are with her and they all uh, manage to get to safety. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing a very different we're seeing a very different kind of story. Women aren't the ones typically writing about mercenaries yeah. and talking about them. So, it's a, there's an agency there that we don't get in the other versions, right? Yeah. 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 That's cool. It's also, I mean, one thing I really liked about that chapter is that, um, you know, disease comes through the mercenaries. Like, that these, the, 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 the crises are wrapped up in each other, right? Yeah. So it's not just the mercenaries show up, but they bring nasty stuff with them, and it creates problems. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that happens with studying these particular fields... Um, looking at, like, say, the Hundred Years' War or military history, um, history of plague, medical history, and history of confession is usually seen as you know, pastoral care or the, the uh, religious history. Um, they get very separated out when people study them, in, when modern scholars study them. Yes. And so it's hard to see that they're deeply interlaced yes. for the people who experience them. And that this... Uh, this source was just brilliant for mm -hmm. seeing how all of these pieces come together. Um, there are medical doctors at the time uh, in mid 14th century pointing out that plague comes back when these soldiers come to Provence yeah. uh, in, in 1360. And we're talking about tens of thousands of mercenaries descending on Provence at this moment. Wow. Um, so we're talking about a lot of people. This wasn't just a couple of people who showed yeah, up and brought the plague with them. This is tens of thousands of people stressing all of the hygienic systems, all of the sanitation systems, everything at this moment. Um, and so it triggers another wave of plague. Mm -hmm. And we kind of get a chance to see then how all of this links together and yeah. why war, plague, and confession make sense to study together, not just as these separate little bits. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, it's really nice. It's like one of these things where, you know, just like we have a different conception of selves and stuff like that. If as historians, we go into these things just as people interested in war or just as people interested in mm -hmm. religion or, you know, I remember one time I asked you, I was like, so you're a historian in religion? And you're like, well, uh, yeah, well, look, man, the, like the period I, I look at, that's like, you kind of have to be if you're going to write about this place, right? Yeah. You, do, you don't get to pick and choose. Yeah. 
<laughs> so I'm, you know, I can see from reading the book and like looking at the footnotes and things that, um, you know, there's a number of things you want to say to other experts in your field and, you know, people who write about medieval history and people who write about this time and this place. But, you know, and we've never kind of talked about how you think of yourself as a historian or how we think about history or stuff like that. But are there more also more kind of general points about humanistic thinking and thinking about the past that you'll hope that you hope attentive readers will walk away with? I'm kind of hoping that people will walk away from reading this book, particularly if they're not uh, medieval historians, if they read it, they take the time to read it, um, of seeing a, a kind of how people use the tools available to them in very yes. interesting, adaptive ways totally. um, that we don't... That, yeah, I mean, we tend to think of religious history or saints in in a way that prohibits us from seeing that these saints were tools for solving problems. Yes, exactly. This was a way that you dealt with things. So uh, we tend to dismiss it as, mm. oh, that doesn't work. That's you know, that's just magic. It's just silly. Um, but for them, this was this was a problem solving tool. So they had a yeah. problem. This was a way that you dealt with it was you uh, used a saint to create a space where people could make peace with each other, where people who were at war or who were starting to, who were heading to war could save face and make peace with each other in the presence of a saint, mm -hmm. um, which they couldn't do outside of, yeah. of, of this presence. So it kind of created this, this, uh, um, kind of special playing field where people could do things differently mm -hmm. um, or they used their saints um, in these moments of crisis. I mean, like mm -hmm. Lady Andrea, you know, finding herself in the middle of an ambush. Um, she prays to a saint, um, not because she thinks the saint is, is necessarily going to magically make everything better, mm. but because this is a tool at that moment that she can use to fortify herself to yeah. make things better. So I think it's, I'm hoping that people who read it uh, coming from other fields see these people as problem solvers. I mean, this, yeah. is, this, is a, this is a difficult moment and they're not just laying down and wishing it were a later time. Yeah. Oh, if we only had antibiotics, right. let's just lay down and die because we don't. Um, this is not happening. They're, they're well, using also, the best tools I mean, they have. I think because we have, because of kind of secular conceptions of what religiosity is, mm -hmm. often we see, especially Christianity, I think, is a kind of passive thing. It's like, oh, we get on our knees and pray to God. But actually, it's like we use all these aspects of religion to do things, actually. Mm -hmm. And so you have to look at religion as a process of use or something like that. Yeah, as an active force. As yeah. something that you actively use in various ways in in your daily life. So yeah, yeah I, I I'm hoping that yeah you can we can kind of temper some of the anti medieval anti religious feelings that kind of blind us to things that would be really helpful. Like, yeah. Gosh, it would be really helpful to have kind of this special playing field where people who are at war can save face and make mm. peace. Wow, well, let's, what can we do, you know? I've talked yeah. a bit about this with, with other groups um, and sort of this concept of restorative justice mm -hmm. um, where how do you get people who are fighting with each other, uh, how do you give people who are, are fighting with each other a, a place to stop, a way to stop? Mm -hmm. um, the people in this book used saints, that used a saint that way, but there are other methods to do this. And I think that's something useful to, to take away. Yeah. Another thing I was thinking about this morning um, is uh, a friend sent me something. I think it might've been from the times. I can't remember uh, who wrote it up, but basically it was about looking at Democrat and Republican areas and like COVID responses to COVID. Mm -hmm. Right. And the question is like, are these things we've been doing really that effective? And the data is so close that it's uncertain. You know, it's like, well, do mass help? It's like, it's it, it, at least in this write-up and with these charts, it was like, eh, we can't really say. Probably a little bit, right? Um, but I won't be surprised in 20 or 30 years if we, you know, we learn that a lot of the things we did during this period were not that effective. 
But then, like, the, I think we have this kind of very modernist, progressivist, scientific view of these things, where it's like, even if that turns out to be true, there are ways of thinking about what we were doing that go beyond the efficacy, right? And there, there, there are other roles these things played in our lives during this period or something like that. Does that make sense to you? It does. Um, and I talk about it in terms of an idea of faith. Mm -hmm. That we tend to think of faith as religious, but faith is just a big umbrella that holds lots of different things that we believe in. Yeah. I believe in, uh, you know, modern science, and modern medicine, and so if they're telling me to wear a mask, and this type of mask, and whatever, I'm gonna try to do that, because I believe it's helping me, and it's making me feel better yeah. um, to, to, to go in with that. Um, and I think we're seeing some of that, in this book, we're seeing people who have a different faith, mm. but if, yeah, but I, I totally agree, if we can kind of see faith as a big umbrella, mm -hmm. and see these behaviors as, you know, or, or these responses to things as yeah. a, a different kind of faith. It's it's useful to see then how people use their faith to solve problems and what they think the problems are. I mean, yeah. the problems aren't always what we think they are. Yeah, totally. But sometimes the problems are, I need to get over the anxiety of being in a crowded room and I need to be able to, I need to be in this crowded room and I have a lot of anxiety doing it this mask helps a lot. Right. I'm going to tell myself whatever I need to tell myself yes. about this yeah. mask. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's what, that, that's, it's solving a problem. Yeah. Totally. So it's, it's useful to have this kind of view of, of being able to look at a community and not judge them. Mm -hmm. And yeah. not impose what I want on them. And that is a, it's a skill that I think historians have that is underutilized. Yes, I think that is a very important thing that we could learn more in our society. In a way. <laughs> I hope we, you know, well, that I try to teach, pass on to my, you know, students. And mm -hmm. you know, I'm teaching a grad methods class right now, and I'm like, you know, what is, what is good inquiry, humanistic, social, scientific inquiry look like? And I think, you know, I think that your book is a very good example of this kind of uh, sympathetic or empathetic reading. Um, Thank you. What are you, so what, are you working on bees now? What, what is, what is up next for you? Well, one of the things that I kept running into in these canonization inquests, and I didn't just look at the one, I've looked at a lot of them, mm -hmm. is people pray for a miracle, they get a miracle, and they say thank you by bringing an amount of wax to huh. the saint's shrine. This can be anywhere from a pound to the saint saved my, you know, saved my baby. I am bringing a chunk of wax the size of my baby oh, to the shrine. Okay. Well, that's yeah. um, or I'm the the saint saved me when I was at sea, and so I am bringing a forty pound wax ship to the shrine, wow. and I'm going to give them this. So, I mean, where do you buy? A forty pound wax yeah. ship. I mean, that's not. Is there is there the the wax ship store? Yeah, there are. I mean, where, what is it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I started, you know, kind of going through and filtering and thinking about this is a lot of wax. Mm -hmm. This is hundreds and hundreds of pounds, and just this one inquest. There's got to be a way to get this. And I yeah. started thinking about why wax. What does this mean? And kind of tumbled down a rabbit hole of figuring out this product. Um, wax is a product that shows up not just in this way, but it's also in medicine. It's in hmm. uh, materials. It's used for seals on letters. Mm -hmm. So bureaucracies go through thousands of pounds of wax hmm. every year um, and have to somehow buy this stuff. Um, where is it produced? So I kind of tugged out this little piece uh, from looking at these documents and I'm tracking that. And that's leading me also in the direction of, okay, so bees produce wax. This is okay. Yeah. So what's special about bees in this that makes beeswax special hmm. that can be given as a gift? Um, and that, you know, it makes sense to bring wax to a saint. Why not olive oil? That burns too, if you want right. to think about candles or, or lighting. Yeah. Um, but it turns out bees are pretty special. And in this 
uh, in this kind of natural philosophy, what we would call science, yeah. uh, view of the world, bees were considered to uh, mate without sex. Hmm. So they were just sort of, they spontaneously generated more bees. Okay. Um, and therefore their products were not tainted by original sin. Oh, and, okay. Right. All right. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, obviously so, that's what I should have been thinking there. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Of course. <laughs> so bees, wax, and candles, you don't, you do not light your church with tallow candles. Huh. I okay. mean, not only do they stink and they're smoky, but um, they're not. They're, yeah. they're not appropriate. They're not virginal in the way that beeswax is. Wow. So I'm going in some interesting directions. I'm hoping to to write about bees and wax in my next book. Yeah, that's cool. And I mean, just to ask one follow-up question, are there like bee farms? Are there like, is there large-scale production places? Or how, I mean, what's the market even look like? The market, certain areas become known for okay. uh, wax and they become exporters of wax. So... Portugal, North Africa, uh, areas in the Baltic, mm -hmm. um, all become very well known for wax and start uh, exporting them to different areas. And if, if you think about the amount, it's, it's hard to even imagine because it's not something we use right. that often today. I mean, you might buy a scented candle, um, but a lot of our candles are not beeswax. They're petroleum products right, um, right. or they're soy or something. Um, and so this is not even the scale that we're thinking of. Would yeah, be, yeah. We're just not using them the way they use them. So yeah. it's hard to imagine the amounts of wax and the ubiquity of wax in people's daily lives. So yes, there are places that are exporting them and a lot of people are importing wax because yeah, a couple, a couple hives on your on, it's not gonna you know, do on it, property, it? not going to cut it. <laughs> yeah. I hope you enjoyed this episode of our podcast. Peoples and things like most things in this world depends on the work of many people. I want to thank my brother Jake Vinsel for writing the music for the show. I want to thank my buddy Juliana Castro for designing the logos for the podcast. You can check out our work at julianacastro.co. Peoples and Things is a production of Virginia Tech Publishing and the University Libraries at Virginia Tech. Production activities are supported by the Athenaeum, a space in the library that acts as a hub for digital humanities teaching, learning, and creation. Joe Fort is the Athenaeum Coordinator and Digital Humanities Specialist at VT Libraries, and he serves as producer and sound engineer for the podcast. For information about other podcasts from Virginia Tech Publishing, visit publishing.vt.edu. I also want to thank you for listening. Thanks. <laughs>